It's because of drought, seasonal drought. <clears throat> and that's that's just the, the, the trap of that intertropical convergence zone over a year. Okay, so that's the global patterns. And then you have a lot of this in your, in your notes, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. The regional patterns get, are, are, so within that big context, that's when the regional patterns develop. And they're influenced by things like proximity to the ocean or the presence of mountain ranges. Okay? And so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Where we are, we're pretty far, we're about as far from the ocean as you can get in the continent of the United States, right? I mean, we're pretty much in the geographic center of the U.S. So that's the difference between a maritime and a continental climate. We say we, we, we have a grassland that's a typical continental climate. What does that mean? It means high variability. Because the oceans, because water buffers, changes in temperature, maritime climates tend to be much more buffered in terms of their extremes compared to continental climates. So if you, this is the difference between the average warmest and average coldest month. In Portland, Oregon, that's 16 degrees. Now these are all at the same latitude. So as you move inland, Spokane, Helena, Bismarck, Bismarck 33 degrees C. Where are we on this thing? We're here. So again, it gets really, really hot in the summer. It gets really, really cold in the winter. But that's characteristic of a continental climate. If we lived in a mountain range, we would have these effects as well. And in fact, the Rocky Mountains do influence our local climate a lot in terms of rain shadow effects. So what the rain shadow effect is, rising air can rise because it's hot, or it can rise because it's being forced over a mountain range. So if you have wind that's, in the case of the Sierra Nevadas in California, we have wind coming in from the coast hitting that mountain range, and it's being forced to rise. That's called, it's called orographic lifting, but you don't need to know that. But some, that's kind of a cool term, right? It's orographic because it's being driven up over a physical structure like a mountain range. So you get orographic lifting. The air has pushed up. And as it goes up, it expands. As it expands, it cools because of adiabatic cooling. As it cools, water condenses. And so on the windward side of the mountain, you will have wetter conditions. That's where most of the rain will fall. As that air crests the mountain and comes back down the other side, it's lost a lot of its moisture. It's now falling, so it's compressing. It's adiabatically heating. And when it comes down this mountain, it's dry and getting warmer, which means the relative humidity is dropping, and it can actually absorb water from the area. So on the, on the leeward, away from the wind side of the mountain, you get drier conditions. That effect is called the rain shadow. So windward side, it's wetter. Leeward side is drier. Okay, so leeward side is often there. So uh, think, think about that, how that influences us. A lot of our air mass movement is from the western United States towards the east. So what do the Rocky Mountains do for the Great Plains? <laughs> they, they, they set up a really strong rainfall gradient. So the driest conditions are nearest the mountains, so uh, eastern Colorado, western Kansas. As you move further east in the plains, that influence is less, and so it gets progressively wetter. So we have a real strong rainfall gradient in the central plains that's based in part on that rain shadow effect in the Rocky Mountains. The other thing, yeah. Uh, to me, the most dramatic one is the Cascades in oh, yeah. Washington, and then you cross over and you go to Moses Lake, and it just Shuts it, shuts it down, yep. It's so completely different. Yeah, no, yeah that, that's a great day. The, the coastal mountain ranges are great examples. And you can see the same thing in South America. I mean, there's a lot of places where that happens. Just really dramatic differences in, from one side of the mountain range to another. <laughs> the other thing that mountains do, and this isn't as relevant to us here, is, 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 is um, aspect matters. Aspect is compass direction. It doesn't face north or south or east or west. And so the basic idea here is that in the northern hemisphere, a south, because the sun is always towards the equator, right? If you're up in the northern hemisphere, even when the sun's high in the sky, it's always to the south. And so a south-facing slope gets more direct solar input than a north-facing slope. And so that can actually result in strong differences in vegetation in mountain ranges, depending on whether you have a north or south-facing slope. This is, you know, it's easy to see this when you fly over the Rockies or other ranges. Uh, that effect doesn't happen in the tropics. 
even when you have high mountains in the tropics. And the reason is that over the course of a year, the sun is pretty much evenly distributed north and south of a mountain range that's at the equator. So the further from the equator you are, the, greatest, the greater the effect. You can actually see a really strong effect of, of aspect in the tundra. Even though you might not have strong hills, any sort of hill there has a pretty large influence on the amount of heat energy coming in. Uh, effects of energy, again, just because you go higher, it gets colder. If we look at this in mountain ranges, that's what's responsible for the bands of vegetation that you see going up a mountain. So in the desert southwest, for example, in the Sierra Nevadas, the base of the mountain is typical Sonoran Desert. As you go up higher, you get into a mixed oak and then <coughs> a conifer forest that looks very much like it would if you were in Canada. Different species, same general appearance. Mm -hmm. You go even higher, you can get into what's called alpine tundra, essentially treeless areas that where plants are limited by, by the cold in the water. Okay. So, so, re so regional climate is important. Um, I'm not, I t mentioned de the deforestation can have an effect. I can relate this to the plains too, though. Um, there's, there's some really neat work out of Colorado State University showing that the amount of irrigation taking place in the plains probably also has a strong influence on our climate. Just like cutting down a forest can cut down on the water flux back to the atmosphere and influence climate, adding extra water by pumping it out of the ground, making it available for plants to transpire, can also influence local climates. Um, Roger Pialki is a climatologist from Colorado State that published a whole series of work showing how irrigation throughout Oklahoma and Kansas um, influences regional climates. And his models, it increases the frequency of thunderstorms, for example, by simply putting more water vapor into the atmosphere. Okay, so. I think what, what I'd like to do, this is probably a good point maybe to take a quick break. Or sure. Finish, finish a couple of slides, if, you want to do this. If, uh, do you guys want to plow through or take a break now? Let's just, break. Let's let's just do this two, sli two slides while I'm thinking of it and then we'll stop. So, so regional, regional climate, here we, here we are, and I mentioned the rain shadow. If we looked at, this is, this is the mean annual precipitation, mean annual rainfall. And it's in millimeters, you'd have to convert it to inches. It's about, you know, we're around here, we're around 32 inches of rainfall. Kansas average is about 835 millimeters. And, and there we are. But this is the rainfall gradient in the Great Plains, going from wettest in the east to driest in the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains. This is our temperature gradient, warmest in the south, obviously, and coldest in the north. The Great Plains are a place where these gradients of temperature and precipitation have a strong effect on everything from the kind of grasslands, whether we have northern or southern mixed grass, short grass steppe, or tall grass prairie, depends a lot on rainfall and precipitation. It also influences things like productivity and decomposition. So our highest, our highest production of grasses obviously is going to be in the southeastern plains. Lowest productivity is the mid short grass step. Grasslands in general are very sensitive to variability in climate. This is a graph showing uh, this is above ground net primary productivity. That's basically plant growth. How much plant material is produced in a year? Above ground net primary productivity. And this is a function of rainfall. <coughs> These are different LTER sites. So this is, uh, Andrews Forest is, in the, is a rainforest in Oregon, an old growth rainforest in Oregon. Very, very wet, very high rainfall. Um, Hubbard Brook and Harvard Forest are deciduous forests in the northeast of the United States. Here we have desert grasslands, Sevilleta from New Mexico, short grass steppe in Colorado, Hans Prairie here. The lines represent the variability in production as a function of variability in rainfall. Bottom line is our grassland sites are very sensitive to interannual variability in rainfall. In a dry year, like last year, we have we have renewable, we don't have a lot of fuel, for example, this year for burning, right? Dry year last year resulted in relatively low production. We have a really wet year, 93, or a typical year even, we get really high productivity. High variability. So, the grasses are sensitive to changes in rainfall amount. This is the record of rainfall for Manhattan, Kansas. This is really cool because we have a, a data set that 
goes back into the, let's see, this goes back to 18, I want to say 1885. It's in the, it's in the late 1800s when, when our rainfall records started to be collected in Manhattan. So we can look at, we can look at you know, the, the, some of the droughts of the 30s and 50s in the context of contemporary climates. Um, this is where we've been doing LTR research. So there's a tremendous interannual variability in rainfall. We have been doing research over a period that's, that reflects some of that rainfall, but what's really missing from here? We've had a couple of really dry years. We, don't, we haven't had the sequence of dry years that have made up the droughts that were historic in the past. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the questions might be, we're, we're, you know, we've been studying Ponds of Prairie for over 30 years now, <coughs> part of the LTR program. But we really, I don't think, understand fully what the, year of mul what the impact of multi-year droughts in these grasslands would be. Is that part of the reason that we're seeing expansion of woody vegetation? You know, regionally, is it that we haven't had multi-year droughts where we might expect higher tree mortality? Just an interesting question to ask. <laughs> so for us, um, I'll, and I'll come back to this and, and if we want to talk a little bit about the experiments and measurements on Kanza. One of the big predictions of climate change, and there are parts of the world where clearly we know what's going to happen. Uh, in, in the north, in the northern hemisphere, northern latitudes, in the tundra and boreal forest, it's getting warmer. There's no doubt about that. Um, it's going to get warmer here in the central plains as well. We, we don't have really good predictions, so that's, that's what these predictions are. Increases in temperature depending on concentrations of CO2 and how they're predicted to change over the next, the next um, century. Actually, the next, the next 30 years in this case. <coughs> Climate change models here don't necessarily predict that it's going to be wetter or drier. They're actually mixed predictions from different models. What most of them do predict, though, is that we should see an increase in extreme events. And the basic idea is that with warmer temperatures, you have greater evaporation. With greater evaporation, you end up with more water vapor in the atmosphere and the potential for more convective thunderstorms. They're spotty. So where though, instead of having large fronts moving through providing rainfall on a, on a more predictable basis, when you have a lot of convective thunderstorms, you end up with areas that get a lot of rain at one time, but they may go long periods without rain between. So one of the more, one of the, that's one of the things we're interested in is what would the impacts be of a climate where you maybe you didn't see a change in the total amount of rainfall, but you saw a change in how that rainfall was distributed into larger storm events with longer dry periods between it. Um, this is this is an older graph. I should I can update this now. But st studies at several places around the world show that the total amount of rainfall coming in large events, say events greater than two inches, is increasing. <laughs> so that's, that's one of the things we're interested in looking at here is what, what impact would that have on these grasslands. So this is a good place to stop.